beautiful man. How y'all doing? <laughs> My name is Marcus Harkis. I'm from North Minneapolis. I like holding the mic. <laughs> So the title of my talk is Holy Herb and Sacred Mushrooms for Education and Liberation. I was asked to be a speaker, so shout out to the person I replaced. I hope that they're well. I don't really have a script, but I have a little outline that I typed on my phone. I'll, I'll try to step away from the phone, but I'm just gonna tell you a little about who I am, my organizing background, how I nearly became a pharmacist, I'll tell you about my experience as a cannabis consumer, as a cannabis legalization advocate, as my experience consuming sacred mushrooms, and then my plan to become a, a decriminalization advocate for the sacred mushrooms. First of all, if you're alive, say yeah. yeah. Some of y'all ain't alive. If you're alive, say yeah. yeah. Okay, give thanks. So. I'm from North Minneapolis, I'm right here. This is my side of town, this is my hometown. I also lived in Louisiana, but this is where I'm from. Uh, I'm a writer, I'm a community organizer, I'm a nonprofit advocate, I'm a social entrepreneur, I'm a traveler. I mean, first and foremost, I'm a father. So shout out to my children, Akili and Madiba. And so, I've been, I was like, I'm like an organizer by nature. You know, I've been, I'm the oldest of five boys and in high school I started trying to like organize protests and all of that. I was politicized by being criminalized by the police, you know, for being black and witnessing the school to prison pipeline here in the Minneapolis public schools. And, you know, fast forward, I became a professional organizer in 2003. I worked on a wide variety of issues youth development, community development, community visioning, housing policy, education policy, uh, equitable hiring and contracting with MnDOT. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff in the nonprofit sector. <laughs> I've been trying to escape the nonprofit sector since 2014, but it's kind of got a grip on me. But when my daughter was, uh, you know, coming into the world, I was trying to think about a career path that would pay more than the nonprofit sector does. You know, nonprofit work is typically non-profitable. <laughs> so I, th I thought about a career in pharmacy, and I started off working in a family practice medical clinic in St. Paul, and then I ended up working a job at, in a hospital pharmacy out at Fairview, uh, Fairview Hospital. I'm not shouting them out. But, you know, as I, as I worked in that clinic, I saw that the only thing the patients were coming for was drugs, for pharmaceuticals. And mo the main thing that most of those doctors do is prescribe pharmaceuticals. I mean, even in my own experience dealing with doctors, and, you know, I respect, I respect doctors and nurses, but, you know, they always want to put you on those pharmaceuticals, you know. I went for some condition and the guys was like, <laughs> you know, I don't want drugs, not those kind of drugs. I do like some drugs, though. And I don't want to have surgeries. But those are usually like the first things that most of them recommend, in my experience. But I had a doctor, I said, well, do you think if I lose weight, this problem will go away? He was like, yeah. I was like, well, why didn't you recommend that? <laughs> anyway, and I still need to lose like 30 pounds. So I'll tell you about my experience as a cannabis consumer. So growing up here on the north side, where it's very over-policed, I began you know, experiencing the racial profiling by the time I was 12. And right down the street, right here on Broadway and Penn, when I was 16, you know, I was driving my dad's uh, minivan, and I had my friends with me. And we were pulled over. We pulled over four times in one night, all in different parts of North Minneapolis. And it's really not that big. So I started counting. And by the time I was in my early 20s, I've been pulled over like over 40 times. I mean, it slows down once you, you know, get older, because they like to prey on the kids and the, the young adults most especially. But that traumatized me. And I was, 
I was brutalized one time on Plymouth Avenue, just like a couple blocks from where the police killed Jamar Clark. Anyone heard of Jamar Clark? We share the same birthday. I remember his sister was actually, I didn't know him, but his sister actually was braiding my daughter's hair. But she, got, she was traumatized when her brother was killed. But when I was brutalized right there on Plymouth Avenue, all I was doing was walking through the snow along the curb during a blizzard, trying to catch a bus right there on uh, Fremont in Plymouth. But I didn't get there because they, you know, they screamed at me on the, on the bullhorn and jumped out and snatched me, tried to snatch me up and slam me on the ice. I refused, <laughs> you know, because I hadn't done anything wrong and they didn't have an explanation for that. But, you know, a couple more of them came and they, you know, they hit me with nightsticks and punched me and all that and uh, abducted me, put me in the car and took me away. Brought me down to the detox center because they asked me how I'd been drinking and I did have one beer. <laughs> it's funny, not funny, right? And... Uh, you know, anyway, long story short, that shit traumatized me. I was traumatized by all those encounters. I was traumatized by seeing a lot of my friends, you know, abused by the police. So that the speaker, the clinician who was talking about that racial trauma, that, that shit is real. So I was about 20 years old at that point, and so I started smoking cannabis heavily. Like, we all see it in high school. You know, a lot of my friends smoke, but I didn't want to smoke. I was... You know, it doesn't look like it now, but I used to be an athlete. <laughs> and um, cannabis really helped me. It helped heal my PTSD to the point where I don't even, I drop that D part, you know. I'm not going to cling on to a disorder. You know, if you can let it go, if you can overcome it, you, sh you should really try. And cannabis really helped me, you know. Um, fast forward, working in the nonprofit sector, by 2014, I was, I was pretty burnt out with that work. Even though it's like there's a lot of good work you do, there's something called a nonprofit industrial complex. And I don't want to go too deep into that, but it's, it's all about the money, you know? They say the bottom line is the bottom line. That's for every sector, government, nonprofit, and for-profit. The bottom line is the bottom line. So I was, I was burnt out with that. And then, uh, you know, I got fired from that pharmacy job for telling a bad joke, and I'm kind of glad that happened. You know, at the time I was mad, especially because those, those white people in Edina told way worse jokes than me, and that shit was always okay for them. But when I, uh, when I reflect on the fact that here I am now in 2021, I've been advocating for cannabis legalization for seven years, it's kind of interesting that, you know, I almost went down a path where I was going to be dispensing pharmaceuticals. And it's, I mean, it's relatively easy work and it's, it's a good living, you know. But in my observations, a lot of those drugs destroy organs and person. I mean, we'd be in that pharmacy receiving medication orders with a dozen, literally a dozen or more prescriptions. And half of them are to counteract the side effects of the first half. So, you know, I'm glad I didn't go down that path. And I'm not against all pharmaceuticals. My mom has thyroid disorder, so that helps her. And my son, for a short time, had a seizure disorder. And I don't know, I was still sketchy about that, but it may have helped him. So I'm just kind of freestyling with my outline, so I hope I'm making But after pharmacy, I, I wanted to figure something else out. Colorado and Washington State legalized cannabis, and then I was introduced to this organization called Minnesota Normal, still a nonprofit, but I got a job there, and I, I got to learn a lot about the drug war. I mean, I witnessed a lot of the drug war right here in this community, but I learned, I learned the, the history of prohibition. I learned how corrupt the whole drug war is, and I won't get into all those details, although I could talk about it for hours because I've, I've studied that much. Um, and, you know, I've witnessed legalization unfold, legalization of cannabis around the country. I've got friends coast to coast in, in a lot of those free states. And, you know, I love cannabis, and I, and I think it's, we should be free to consume it, and I do, I do want to see stories. I mean, but I've seen how most states have ruined legalization. I mean, I have a friend in Seattle he opened up the first licensed and taxed medical dispensary, and 
the state of Washington just r really ruined, really ruined legalization. I mean, California ruined legalization. Illinois, uh, you could name it. Most of these states, they have fucked up models of legalization. And I'm a lobbyist. I'm a nonprofit lobbyist. So, like, the Minnesota model will be better than all these other states because I'm not trying to, like, take sole credit. But because people like me are there at the table and, you know, advocating for equitable models of legalization, advocating for not prohibition light. Like, most of these states are satisfied saying, oh, you can have an ounce of weed and you're good. But then they still arrest people if you have more than that. You know, I'm, I'm at the Capitol and, you know, I give them a hard time <laughs> because I say we can't have prohibition light. You can't keep arresting us, you know. The numbers may go down, but the disparities persist and they're still targeting young people. So I'm not satisfied with, with half measures like that. Um, anyway, so, and during my time, you know, advocating for legalization, I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people, you know. People write me, people talk to me, telling me the, the many ways that this natural medicine has helped improve their quality of life. And in this past year and a half, you know, COVID is a real big problem. But honestly, for me, the worst thing it's done is cost me money. But during this same time, you know, I've gone through the, the worst period of my life on a personal level. I was displaced from my home, you know. I lost almost everything. I mean, I've, you know, I'm not going to go into the details. I got divorced recently. So I've had a hard time. You know, life is hard. It's good, though. And... And a half, I've tried. I've you know, I've been uh, experiment. I've been consuming sacred mushrooms, and Corey gave me the language to sacred mushrooms. Like I dropped the magic part. <laughs> I do think it's magical though. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like the the sacred mushrooms have really helped, like help heal me a lot. And you know, I feel like. Sometimes I experience a certain kind of enlightenment, you know. I, I, I describe it as an extrasensory experience, you know. It, it makes me see a little clearer, you know. It makes me hear better. It makes me feel a little deeper. And so I think it's a wonderful thing, and I don't think anybody should be criminalized for it. Now, you know, I, I met Corey recently, and she's, I mean, she's a healer, right? This is a, this is a, a wonderful healer. And I was blessed to do the sweat lodge experience with them the other day. But, you know, she said, we want to decriminalize. We don't want it legalized. And, you know, I can get down with that. I mean, honestly, if they just stop criminalizing people for cannabis, they don't have to legalize it. I'll just be, be frank with you. We just want people to stop being harassed. We want the pe police to stop using it as a tool to ruin people's lives and give people a hard time. So... I'm going to, I'm interested in decriminalizing uh, sacred mushrooms here in, at the local level because this is where I'm from. This is where I'm at. So if anybody would be interested in that, if anybody has any, you don't even have to have experience. You just have to have the desire to, you know, organize and advocate. So if anybody's down to do that, we should do it right here. I mean, Denver did it in 2019. Oregon, the state of Oregon did it last year at a statewide level. I mean, it was through a referendum, but. It all, all it takes is organizing. So if anybody's down to do that, you know, I'm here for it. And I won't talk much longer. I think I went much less than 30 minutes. So if we have questions, I, I can answer them. I mean, I want to ask a few questions first, though. How many of y'all would consider yourselves experts on psychedelics? Or you have some expert knowledge? Yeah, well... We, those of us who are new to this, we are leaning on you for the education. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Like I met uh, Dr. Carl Hart, who's a neuroscientist and a drug addiction researcher out of New York. I mean, he's from Miami, but he's in New York. And one of the things that he's, he taught me, you know, if you're going to try drugs, you need to get educated on how to use them, right? <laughs> it's just like if you go to a pharmacy, there's instructions and you get consultations. So, like, I, I want to introduce uh, the sacred mushrooms and cannabis to 
you know, I don't pressure anyone and I don't, you know, give people a hard time for being different, but I think we should educate our friends and our loved ones about the potential health benefits of these, uh, these plant-based medicines, this, this fungi. Um, did anybody learn something here today? I mean, not necessarily from me. I mean, I learned a lot, so I, I loved your talk. I, I loved everybody, but I have a passion for learning. And I'm going to stop rambling. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. So sure. yeah, and a lot of this thing, I mean, the way it's regulated, it, it's in favor of big businesses, and it cuts out, you know, smaller and mid-sized businesses or people who, it, it, it like, there's, there's barriers to entering the, the legal industry, such as, like, crazy licensing fees where you have to spend tens of thousands of dollars just to get a license. Here in Minnesota, we're not even going to have a license fee. You're just going to have to pay a $250 application fee. So that's one way it'll be easier. And there's a system called vertical integration. So within the cannabis industry, you have producers like the cultivators. You have processors, people who make like infused products or you know, edibles. Uh, and then you have retailers. So in Minnesota, no, no entity will be allowed to have all different kinds of licenses. You'll be limited, like if you choose to be a retailer, you're not gonna be allowed to be a cultivator also. And I mean, it might sound like why not, but the people that already have 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars, like if they were able to dominate the whole spectrum, you know, that, that's, that would just cut us all out. The rest, I mean, those of us who, and I am interested, I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> Honestly, after the pharmacy thing was done, I was thinking, what else do I like? <laughs> and I like craft beer, you know, and it shows. But then they started legalizing cannabis, and I was like, no, nah, I'd rather do that, you know. Alcohol kills people. Cannabis heals people. So th there's other ways that we're going to have a more equitable uh, licensing thing. Like, in terms of cultivation alone, and I'll, I'll pull myself out this rabbit hole because I can go to, I mean, I mean I'm on policy geek, you know? But um, like with cultivators, just as another example, there's going to be two license, uh, license types for the cultivators. You'll be able to have up to 10,000 uh, square feet cultivation facility or 30,000 30, and no more than that. So nobody's going to be able to set up a million square foot growing facility. So that creates more opportunities for other people. And there's also going to be a, a micro enterprise license. So that's the only area uh, where you could be fully ver vertically integrated. So production, processing, and retailing. So yeah, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I could go deep. You know, it's like a 200-page bill. The timing all depends on when we get a legislature that will pass it. Like most of the states where cannabis has been legalized, the voters did that. but Half the states don't have an initiative or referendum system where we could collect signatures on a petition and get it on a ballot. That doesn't happen in Minnesota. It could never happen. So we need a legislature that would do that. And just this year, we passed the bill in the House, and it's a decent one. I mean, it's good except for the criminal penalty section, but I know we still have time to you know, work that out. But uh, the Republican-controlled Senate is against it. So we're having an election. Um, 20, next year at the state level, and if we can flip the Senate, then we'll get it in like two years. But, I mean, if the Republicans control either the, the House or the Senate, it's not going to happen, you know. <laughs> We're going to say the same thing when the next election comes around. It all depends on the election. Well, they, they have predictable answers. They say, oh, we don't want youth access, even though the kids already have access. <laughs> They'll say, uh, oh, it's going to cause a bunch of drug driving. Like, people ain't already high in driving now. And is it really a problem? We would already know about it if, if it was. 
I mean, the real reason that they will never admit is because law enforcement lobbies are against legalization because they profit from it. They get money from ticketing you. They get money from <laughs> arresting you. There's money from processing you through the court system. There's money for putting you in those cages. And there's money for the supervised release. So it's for-profit policing. Yeah, I, yeah, disproportionately. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're 5% of the state. We're like 31% of the people that, you know, get prosecuted for it. So. But that's the real reason. They won't admit that. They'll say they, they don't want youth access or drug driving or it's going to encourage everybody to start smoking. Do you think everybody started smoking in those states where it's legal just because it's legal? No, y'all don't have to smoke if you don't want to. Yes, ma'am. Well, that is, there, there are efforts to try to make sure that the, the cannabis that's cultivated is organic. So that's, that's likely going to happen, which is a good thing. So donors aren't going to be allowed to profit if they get licensed to vote? No, no. If, like, if you're a cultivator, you could, I think you can also get a cultivation license. You just won't be able to get a retail license, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, like you can get multiple license types, but you just can't get all of them. And so like if you have a retail business, you, you can't own a processing facility or a, a grow. Yeah, yeah but, you could, but you can also like deliver, get a delivery license or an event license. There's gonna be 10 license types. And I'm proud to say that I, I introduced that to these legislators, like create as many opportunities as possible. Yeah. Well, we're trying to get them. They'll be called cannabis lounges. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, honestly, there's that Clean Indoor Act that makes it a little tricky. So there'll probably be like fenced in outdoor areas with tents, you know, and on the inside, you'll be able to vape or eat edibles or whatever, infuse drinks. But yeah, that's, that's probably gonna happen. Um, the Minnesota Legislature is a pretty good website. If you just uh, type in mnledge.gov backslash cannabis. I mean, this session is done, so they're going to have to reintroduce the bill in the next session, next year. So it'll be assigned a different number. But if you look up House File or HF600 and enter the MN, so it'll show up for Minnesota bills, it'll come up. I mean, there's also a website that I've had, I'm going to dissolve the organization I founded. It's called the Minnesota Campaign for Full Legalization. That's why I didn't really pub it. But the website is still up there. It's legalizeitmn.com. And then uh, if you look up uh, the Minnesota Campaign for Full Legalization on Facebook, I've posted all that stuff up there. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, there, we, there, I don't want to say we, but there's going to be uh, home, personal home use cultivation allowed. And they say you can grow up to four plants. The good thing is nobody's going to come around counting. <laughs> they, you know what? They, that's why we have to be at the table when public policy is being proposed, because they come up with the worst ideas, I'm telling you. They wanted to have a, a permit required for that. And we say, hell no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's about being free, right? There's no caregiver system that's been proposed, but I mean, I, I, our medical program is the worst in the country. I mean, they're making incremental reforms. I don't believe in incremental reforms, though. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that, it's trash. It's trash. Full legalization is, is the best way to solve that problem because then we can, there's more room to improve that. I do think we should have a medical system, but what we have is good. Well, those two companies, the only two companies that are allowed licenses, they don't want you to grow your own. I mean, it's trash. It's, I'm sorry? 
Exactly. I mean, that's because you had the law enforcement lobby. You know, in 2014, when the medical bill passed, I mean, they were trying to kill it. But when they, they brought all these uh, women and, and babies that were sick and stuff and people were crying, you know, they said, oh, we can't completely stop it. So we're going to try to make it as weak as possible, as restrictive as possible. But that's why we have to show up. We have to get organized and fight back against, you know, these uh, defenders of injustice. The law enforcement lobbies. Shout out to the Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association. I would say the County Attorneys Association is neutral, finally. And the uh, Peace Officers Association. Those are the people who you can blame for the terrible medical cannabis program. All right, is my time done? Well, I have one more question for you. Is anyone down to help try to organize to decriminalize cannabis in Minnesota? Okay. Well, I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you my number if you'd like. It's, it's on my business card. 952-999-1095. 952-999-1095. And also, if you're interested in cannabis legalization, you could text the words MN legal, all one word, to 42420. It's a real thing. You'll get a response. <laughs> All right. Thank y'all. Peace and blessings.